Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. So you excited to go visit where you're going to live in Italy? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, actually getting a place to live. In November of 2007, all eyes were on Italy. A horrifying murder had just taken place. The media reported on a sex game gone wrong. At the center of this gruesome story was a 20-year-old American exchange student named Amanda Knox. And what started out as a year abroad ended in her and her boyfriend being accused of stabbing her roommate. Today's episode is filled with so many twists and turns that I wish I could tell you it's all made up. But there's a reason this case and the events surrounding it have been called the trial of the century. Fair warning, today's episode is at times dark and shocking. At some points, it's unbelievable. I'm Brooke. Thanks for tuning in to Armchair Investigator. As you're watching, be sure to let me know your thoughts on it. Amanda Marie Knox was born on July 9, 1987, in Seattle, Washington, to Etta Mellis and Kurt Knox. Her mom was a math teacher, and her dad was the vice president of finance at Macy's. When Amanda was just a year old, her parents divorced. Despite this, her parents were determined not to let their divorce affect their two daughters negatively. They even bought houses just two blocks apart so Amanda and her younger sister Deanna could have both parents present in their lives. Etta and Kurt both remarried, and her father went on to have two more children, Ashley and Delaney, with his second wife, Cassandra. Amanda describes herself as outgoing, quirky, goofy, naive, and even a bit immature. Growing up, she felt different from her peers. She knew she didn't fit in, but embraced it. She had a love for musical theater and was athletic. Amanda loved playing soccer, and she was good at it. Her quick, nimble skills on the field earned her the nickname Foxy Noxy, a name that would later be used against her. In 2005, she graduated from Seattle Preparatory High School and entered the University of Washington later that fall, planning to pursue a degree in linguistics. Going into college, Amanda said she felt a little behind her peers. She said she didn't have a ton of life experience and grew up kind of sheltered. She knew that if she was going to grow up, she needed to get out of her comfort zone. And she always knew that she wanted to have an international experience. Italy would be a great place to do that, and with the history, the vineyards, the art and culture, what better place to find yourself? Amanda worked three jobs and managed to save up almost $8,000 in order to be able to afford the study abroad program. And with her parents on board, everything was coming together beautifully. She was able to secure a place to stay during one of her early visits to Perugia when a woman was posting flyers outside the university advertising a room for rent. Amanda was able to go look at it that day and it was super close to the university. It was like it was meant to be. In late September of 2007, 20-year-old Amanda heads to Perugia where she planned to spend the next year at the University for Foreigners. The house Amanda would be staying in was at the top of the hillside overlooking a valley. The views were stunning, and you could see houses dotting the horizon for miles and miles. Amanda would be living with two Italian legal students, Filomena Romanelli and Laura Mazzetti, and 21-year-old British student Meredith Kircher from South London. Meredith was thrilled to be studying abroad in Italy and wanted to immerse herself fully in Italian culture. She was studying European politics and Italian at the University of Leeds in West Yorkshire. In August of 2007, she arrives in Perugia prepared to start her exchange year. On September 20th, Amanda moves into the house at Via Della Pergola 7. Her three other roommates had already moved in. I want to explain the layout of the house. It was actually split into a top unit and a bottom unit. The four girls were renting out the top unit and a group of four Italian male students rented out the bottom. The layout of the house was basically in the shape of an L. Philomena and Laura's rooms were near the front entrance, while Meredith and Amanda's rooms were towards the back. 
As Amanda adjusted to life abroad, she was enjoying all Perugia had to offer, exploring the city, going out, and meeting new people. The study abroad program wasn't quite what Amanda had pictured it would be when she initially signed up. She thought she was signing up for a rigid academic program, but what she soon found was that there wasn't a ton of work involved. The experience of living in Italy was the work. She got a job to occupy some of her time and started working two days a week at a pub called Le Chic. The owner, Patrick Lumumba, thought hiring Amanda would bring in customers. Amanda explained, In Seattle, I was cute. In Italy, I was the beautiful blonde American girl. Something she'd never been before. On October 25th, Amanda and her roommate Meredith attended a classical music recital at the university. Because Meredith had to leave early, it freed up the seat next to Amanda. That's how she meets Italian student Raffaele Selecido, who was studying information technology at the University of Perugia. Between the broken English and broken Italian, there was an instant connection. Amanda said that Raffaele was different from the other Italian men she had met. He wasn't coming on strong or trying to force himself onto her. He was a gentleman and in her eyes, charming. After the concert, the two spent every minute of their spare time together. Raffaele showed Amanda around the city. They explored, ate yummy foods, hung out, and went to the local markets. But their whirlwind romance would come to an abrupt halt on November 2nd, 2007, when Meredith was found dead. She had been brutally murdered. The events that occurred on the night of November 1st, 2007 still remain a mystery to this day. Law enforcement, the media, and the public have been left to try and put together the pieces. On the morning of November 2nd at 9 a.m., a local woman finds two cell phones in her garden and hands them over to the postal police. Side note, Italy has different police divisions. The postal police handle crimes involving telecommunication. One of the cell phones is registered to a small house less than half a mile away, but they both belong to Meredith. She had one phone for daily use in Italy and one in order to talk to her family back home in London. When the postal police arrive, they see two people standing in the driveway, Amanda and Raffaele. They tell police the door is open. When police enter the upper unit, they find one of the bedrooms in shambles. Clothes are scattered around the room and a large rock is lying on the floor near the window. Shortly after the post of police arrive, at 12.54 p.m., Raffaele calls the Carabinieri, another one of Italy's police forces. Phone records indicate that at 12.50, he calls his sister, who's a police lieutenant, to ask for advice. Then he calls for emergency services. Qualcuno è praticamente entrato in casa sfondando la finestra e ha messo un molto di sordine e c'è una porta chiusa. Interestingly enough, when he calls for help, he doesn't mention that the post of police are already there, but it sounds like they were just there to return the cell phones. At this point, nobody knew anything had happened to Meredith. By 1.15 p.m., the Carabinieri are on the scene. Amanda and Raffaele are there along with Filomena, her boyfriend Marco Zaroli, Filomena's friend Paola, and Paolo's boyfriend Luca Altieri. Because Meredith's bedroom door is locked and nobody's been able to get in touch with her, Filomena, Marco, Paola, and Luca make the decision to break open her door. Nobody was prepared for the gruesome sight they encountered. A twin bed is against the wall on the left side of Meredith's room. The only thing on it is a fitted sheet, a bath towel, a purse, a book, and a binder. Next to the bed is a small dresser slash nightstand with a glass of water on it along with her birth control pills, pajamas, a book, nail clippers, and a few pieces of mail. A white desk and armoire filled with clothes are on the right side of the room near the window. Pictures of Meredith's friends and family are on the wall. It was immediately clear that a struggle had taken place. On the floor was a crumpled blue rug and various clothing items, a pair of jeans, socks, underwear, a satchel, shoes, a bloody bra. A beige duvet was spread out on the floor. 
a foot was sticking out from it. Underneath the duvet lie Meredith Kircher's lifeless body. Giuliano Menigni, the lead prosecutor on the case, said, The crime scene. It's a memory that will always be with me. There was blood everywhere. The body had been covered. There were signs that she'd been violently held down. Her throat had an extremely deep wound. Who could have done this? In Giuliano's mind, the answer was clear. Only a monster could do something this violent. Outside, two young people caught his attention, Amanda and Raffaele. He said, they were comforting each other with an affection that seemed inappropriate for the moment. The media went nuts. Tabloids called it the house of horrors. Headlines ran like, Maniac Cuts Throat of Exchange Student. The laws in Italy regarding journalism differ from other countries. That meant the case could be reported on without limits, and speculation of any kind was allowed. Because the case garnered worldwide attention, there was a lot of pressure being placed on local law enforcement to quickly solve Meredith's murder. Investigators were working around the clock to figure out a motive. Who was Meredith friends with? Did she have any romantic relationships? The answer to the last question is yes. Meredith had just started dating Giacomo Salenzi, one of the four guys who lived in the apartment unit directly beneath the girls. Since it was a bank holiday in Italy, all four guys had been out of town when Meredith was killed, and Giacomo had been at his parents' house since Monday. Piecing together a timeline of Meredith's day on November 1st, we know that at roughly 4 p.m. she left her apartment. At 4.30, she arrives at her friend Sophie's house. At 6 o'clock, they meet up with another group of friends to eat pizza and watch The Notebook. At 8.45, Meredith and Sophie walk home together. At 8.50, Meredith and Sophie part ways, and Meredith walks the rest of the way to her apartment alone. At 8.55 p.m., she arrives home and calls her mom, but the call is interrupted. It's believed Meredith was killed at some point between 8.56 p.m. and 9.30. When the autopsy report came back, it showed that Meredith had been the victim of an SA. Traces of male DNA had been found. She was strangled and had two major knife wounds to her neck, one on the left side that was eight centimeters deep and a four centimeter deep wound on the right side. It was the second stab that proved fatal, piercing her thyroid artery. Given the differences in the size of the wounds, it's believed that more than one knife was used. But that wasn't all. It looked as if Meredith had been tortured and held at knife point due to the small cuts on her chin. In total, there were more than 40 wounds, half of them being to her head and neck. Due to the number of wounds Meredith had sustained, the lack of defensive wounds on her hands and forearms, coupled with the fact that she was trained in karate, police felt that there was more than one assailant. Once this was revealed, the tabloids began reporting on an orgy gone wrong. Now, the fact that Meredith was trained in karate intrigued me. Meredith was an orange belt, which means she would have had to master karate's 10 self-defense moves. I don't know hardly anything about karate, but it's said that once you reach a blue belt is when you'll actually be able to defend yourself. Meredith was still two belts away from that. I think it's also important to note that she was 17 during her karate lessons, and from what I've read, it can take three to six months to earn your orange belt. If she stopped at her orange belt, it's possible that she hadn't trained in three years. Can anyone speak to this? Would Meredith being an orange belt have given her a significant advantage over her attacker? Amanda says that what happened to Meredith could have easily happened to her, but she was at Raffaele's apartment the night Meredith was killed. She claims that night, the two had been watching the movie Amelie. During the movie, she got a text from her boss, Patrick, saying she didn't need to come into work since it was a slow night. So after the movie, the couple made dinner together, and then Amanda read a German Harry Potter book. Around 8.40 p.m., fellow student Giovanna Popovic knocks on Raffaele's door to let him know that she no longer needs a ride to the train station. For the rest of the evening, the two hung out, chatted, smoked marijuana, and got a little frisky before going to bed. 
The next morning, Amanda says she made the walk from Raffaele's apartment back to her place. Upon arriving home, the first thing she notices is that the front door is open. But other than that, everything else looked normal. At first glance, it appeared that nothing was missing or out of sorts as if the place had been robbed. So Amanda doesn't think much of it and heads into one of the bathrooms to shower. That's when she sees a few drops of blood in the sink, but it doesn't set off any alarms for her. Amanda brushes her teeth and then gets in the shower. It wasn't until after her shower that she notices a large blood stain on the bath mat. Again, she didn't think much of it. After all, there were four girls living in there. It's possible one of them cut themselves while shaving. It isn't until Amanda is blow drying her hair in the second bathroom that she notices the toilet. Someone had used it and didn't bother to flush, leaving feces behind. According to Amanda, that's when things didn't feel right. She said she felt as if someone was in there with her. She immediately leaves and gets Raffaele. The two return to Amanda's together and have a look around. That's when they notice the broken window in Philomena's room. Meredith's room is locked and she isn't responding to her name being called. Was Meredith in her room? They weren't sure. Raffaele tries breaking open the door but can't get it open. That's when he makes a call to police letting them know that someone made a mess in the house there was blood in the bathroom, and that one of the roommate's door is locked and they didn't know where she was. Amanda calls Philomena to let her know what's going on. Once the decision is made to break open Meredith's door and the tragic scene is uncovered, police immediately order everyone out of the unit. Because Meredith's body is covered with a blanket, investigators feel whoever did this had to be a woman. Right away, a few things stand out. Despite the broken window in Philomena's room, there was no evidence that someone had scaled the wall to climb in through it. To detectives, it looked like a stage break-in, especially because the broken glass from the rock was sitting on top of rather than underneath the mess in the room, which meant the window was most likely broken after the room was ransacked. Not to mention that the rock seems too large and heavy to be thrown from the ground through Philomena's window, which was more than 11 feet off the ground. This leads detectives to believe that whoever broke the window did so from inside the room. And nothing was actually stolen, even though some of the most tempting items were lying around. A purse, laptop, iPod, camera, and jewelry case. A trail of bloody shoe prints leads from Meredith's room to the front door. The next day, police bring Amanda back to the house and have her go through the knife drawer to see if any of the knives are missing. It was then Amanda said it hit her all at once and she became hysterical. Lead prosecutor Giuliano said Amanda began hitting the palms of her hands against her ears. It was as if she was having a flashback of some type, perhaps a sound or scream, maybe Meredith screams. That's the exact moment they begin to suspect that Amanda is involved. Police wiretap both Amanda and Raffaele's phones. Over the next four days, investigators collect more than 400 items from the house. One of those items is Meredith's bra. As police are collecting it for evidence, they notice it's missing the hook and eye closure. We'll talk more on the bra clasp later. It becomes one of the most controversial pieces of evidence in the investigation. Meanwhile, the couple's behavior continues to rub people the wrong way. Meredith's friends report that the pair don't seem at all troubled by what's just happened. At the police station, Meredith's friend Robin said, everyone was crying, but Amanda was not crying. She was not showing any emotions. She and Raffaele were kissing and joking together. They were cuddling and at one point, she stuck her tongue out at him. And what was probably the most upsetting was that they didn't attend Meredith's vigil. Now, like I've said in past videos, everyone reacts and processes things differently, especially tragic events. It's not like there's a manual for how to behave during times like these. But I will say, I could understand why people thought they were coming off as insensitive. Footage taken on November 2nd of the couple kissing outside the home where Meredith was just murdered spreads like wildfire. Many were put off by it. Some say they were simply comforting one another. What do you think? 
On November 5th, there's a development in the investigation when Raffaele is called into the police station for questioning just after 10 p.m. Now, Amanda is not asked to come in any official capacity, but she accompanies Raffaele and waits for him. Once again, stories surface of Amanda's odd behavior. This time, she's doing yoga, cartwheels, and stretching in the waiting room of the police station. I can't help but think about Jody Arias and her behavior during her interrogation. But that's a whole nother terrifying story. Amanda has spoken out about the incident and says that doing yoga is one way she relieves stress. As police are questioning Raffaele, they want to know what he and Amanda were doing the night Meredith was killed. Now, if you remember, Amanda said she was at Raffaele's for the night. They watched a movie, made dinner, and hung out before going to sleep. But police weren't letting up. Were they trying to turn Amanda and Raffaele against one another? Maybe. After a while, Raffaele said he became confused. Had Amanda been with him all night? He wasn't so sure. Soon, his version of events from the night Meredith was killed changes. He tells investigators he had been lying because Amanda told him to. He said, In my previous statement, I told a load of rubbish because Amanda had convinced me of her version of the facts and I didn't think about the inconsistencies. Raffaele says he was home that night, but Amanda didn't show up at his place until 1 a.m. With a signed confession from Raffaele, the police confront Amanda and let her know that her boyfriend has turned on her. Because she's technically still considered a witness, at 12.30 a.m., an interpreter named Anna Donino arrives. Not only does Anna act as an interpreter, but she also serves as a mediator, something that's been scrutinized since, at that time, she had worked for the Prussia police for 22 years. Amanda's defense argues a conflict of interest, that the interpreter should have been a neutral, third-party translator. Police ask to see Amanda's cell phone. They hone in on the text between her and her boss, Patrick. When Patrick tells Amanda she doesn't need to come into work, Amanda had texted back basically saying, okay, see you later, have a good night. But it was written in Italian. Police believe that her response meant she was going to see Patrick later that evening. I can't even imagine how scary it would be to be in another country where you're not fluent in the language, a tragic event has happened, and you're being accused of something, and the people who love and care about you are thousands of miles away. Amanda has literally found herself in the worst case scenario. If you're someone who's learning a second language, you can probably attest to this. It doesn't matter how much you know. When you speak with someone whose native language is the language you're learning, the speed in which they talk can make it almost impossible to comprehend. You might only be catching every three or four words. And sometimes the way we say things don't translate or have the same meaning in another language. Remember, this is the early 2000s. There were no translations apps on cell phones. I know people who travel with these apps and swear by them, but in 2007, they weren't around. Amanda said during that interrogation, a police officer had slapped her on the back of the head twice. To say it sounded like an intense interrogation is an understatement. They told Amanda that she had met up with Patrick, but she must not have remembered it. At 1.45 a.m., Amanda's story officially changes. She tells police that, yeah, she was with Patrick. They met up at the basketball court on Piazza Gramana around 9 p.m. and went to her house. She tells police that Patrick was infatuated with Meredith and wanted to have sex with her. Amanda said she was in the kitchen when she heard Meredith scream. She said, I recall confusedly that he killed her. Amanda's confession is typed up and she signs it. The things she detailed made her an accomplice to Meredith's murder. At 5.45 a.m., another confession is typed up. In it, Amanda repeats much of the same information from her 1.45 a.m. confession, but this time adding in slight details. She also adds that she's very afraid of Patrick. Following Amanda's signed November 5th confessions, the following day, on November 6th, police arrest Patrick, Raffaele, and Amanda. And bada boom, bada bing, case closed. Authorities hold a press conference that day announcing that they are pleased to have gotten their answers and solved the case in such a short time. 
Police Chief Arturo De Felice said, I have to compliment our men and our women that in four days and four nights, with professionalism and integrity, have resolved the case. In these days, we have felt the weight, the pressure of the people of the city, and of the mass media. Everybody wanted an immediate and certain response. It seems to me we have responded almost immediately. That press conference was a little premature. And I know, you're probably asking yourself, if none of that happened, why say it did? Well, this occurs more often than you might think. According to the Innocence Project, about 25% of the 365 people exonerated in the last few decades had falsely confessed to their alleged crime. This is in part due to a number of reasons like interrogation techniques, psychological pressure, and wanting the interrogation to be over. People are especially vulnerable to making a false confession when they are stressed, tired, or traumatized. If you're a true crime buff, you've most likely seen this played out. Studies have also shown that it's easy to make people falsely recall memories. In some studies, all it took was a suggestion from an authoritative figure and the subject's imagination did the rest. A wonderful yet sad example of false memories and false confessions is the 1988 case of Martin Tankliff, a 17-year-old high school senior from Long Island who awoke to find his adoptive parents had been attacked. Both had been brutally stabbed. His mother was found dead on the floor in her bedroom. His father was on a chair in his office, barely alive. Marty quickly called 911. When police arrive, he names his father's business partner as a possible suspect. After all, the guy owed his father nearly half a million dollars, had recently threatened his parents, and was just at their house the night before. Marty was later interrogated at the police station for hours. He maintained his innocence the entire time. It wasn't until an officer told him that his father regained consciousness at the hospital and named him as the killer. In actuality, his father died weeks later without ever having regained consciousness. But Marty was so devastated by the news that it led him to question everything. He ended up taking responsibility for both murders, saying that he must have blacked out when he killed them. In 1990, a jury convicted him of murder. He spent 17 years in prison before the real murderers were found. Going back to Amanda's story, as she's waiting to be taken to jail, she writes a note in English attempting to further explain herself. She said, In regards to this confession that I made last night, I want to make clear that I'm very doubtful of the verity of my statements because they were made under the pressures of stress, shock, and extreme exhaustion. Not only was I told I would be arrested and put in jail for 30 years, but I was also hit in the head when I didn't remember a fact correctly. It was under this pressure and after many hours of confusion that my mind came up with these answers. In my mind, I saw Patrick in flashes of blurred images. I saw him near the basketball court. I saw him at my front door. I saw myself cowering in the kitchen with my hands over my ears because in my head, I could hear Meredith screaming. But I've said this many times so as to make myself clear. These things seem unreal to me, like a dream. Amanda went on to pose a few questions to authorities. Why did Raffaele lie? Why did she name Patrick? Is the evidence of her being at the scene during the crime reliable? Is there any other evidence convicting the three of them, and who is the real murderer? She ends her letter by saying, All I know is that I didn't kill Meredith, and so I have nothing but lies to be afraid of. Meanwhile, more stories about Amanda continue to emerge, painting her as cold, aloof, and uncaring. It wasn't long before Amanda's social media was thrust into the limelight and her photos were everywhere. If you followed the case back in 2007, you might remember this picture of her at a museum in Germany surfacing, where she's pretending to fire a machine gun while laughing. These pictures appeared next to photos of Raffaele dressed as a mummy holding a meat cleaver. It was pure fodder for the tabloids, and then they find Amanda's MySpace handle, Foxy Noxy. It was plastered all over the front pages of newspapers. Patrick always maintained his innocence, and he had an alibi. 
a customer at his bar, a Swiss professor, came forward saying Patrick couldn't have done it because he was at the bar that night. Nearly three weeks after his arrest, Patrick is released. Nobody could understand why she'd named Patrick in the first place. Was she really that cold-hearted to accuse somebody of a crime that had nothing to do with it? In her explanation to the prosecutor on December 17, 2007, Amanda said she was stressed, scared, and exhausted. Why? You Why? Because I was scared. Why? Because I was scared. It was after long hours in the middle of the night. I was innocent, and they were telling me that I was guilty. What did the police tell you? The police are telling me that we know you're at our house, we know you left the house, and what the moment before I said Patrick's name, they were put, someone was showing me the, um, the message that I was sent on the phone. Che cosa c'è di più normale che insistere? La polizia fa la sua parte. I couldn't could understand why they were telling me that I was lying. They kept telling non me that I was perché... lying. Ma che pot perché poi prima ci ha detto potrebbe essere vero. It means that in that moment that I had said Patrick's name, I thought it could have been true. She said the moment before she said Patrick's name, they brought up their text messages from the night he texted her, saying she didn't have to come into work. She said it was during that moment she thought it could be true that Patrick had killed Meredith. Amanda's being held at Capan Prison. At the time, it housed 201 men and 31 women. During Amanda's intake, she's given a medical examination, which is typical protocol. You get your vitals taken, blood drawn, and you'll be tested for communicable diseases. Think chickenpox, COVID-19, hepatitis B and C, and so on. Shortly after, prison authorities tell Amanda that she's HIV positive and that she's going to develop AIDS. Amanda was shocked and terrified that she was going to die. In her diary, she makes a list of every person she's been sexually active with. Somehow, her diary gets leaked to the media, and now the whole world knows about her status as well as the names of all her sexual partners. Except there's just one thing. Amanda didn't have HIV. Yeah, were the police authorities playing mind games with her? I can't even begin to imagine what Amanda was going through, the roller coaster of emotions she must have been experiencing. So, what evidence do police actually have in Meredith's murder? On November 16th, police search Raffaele's apartment and find a kitchen knife they believe could fit the description of a knife that would have been used in the murder. And Amanda's DNA is on it, near the top of the handle. They also claim that Meredith's DNA is on the blade. It would make sense for Amanda's DNA to be found on it. After all, we know that she was spending time at Raffaele's apartment and the two cooked meals there together. But how did Meredith's DNA end up on it? We know that Patrick Lumumba has been cleared as a suspect, but police find evidence that three people were definitely involved in Meredith's death. This story takes one bizarre turn after another. Who was the third person? Police are certain that the third person involved is 20-year-old Rudy Gaudet, an immigrant who's been living in Italy for the last 15 years. Detectives find his bloody handprint on a pillow under Meredith's body and several shoe prints in her room and throughout the apartment that were consistent with the pair of tennis shoes he owned, including two shoe prints found in the kitchen and two in the hallway. Because Rudy's an immigrant, his fingerprints are on file. Police raid Rudy's apartment and test his toothbrush for DNA. It's a match for much of the DNA found all over Meredith's room. His DNA is also found inside Meredith, on her bra, her blue Adidas sweatshirt, and her purse, from which her wallet, keys, and cell phone are missing. His DNA is also consistent with the fecal samples taken from the toilet. And Rudy had a history of breaking and entering, he was already known to police as the prime suspect in at least three burglaries. Locals knew him as a shady character. By this point, he'd fled to Germany. In fact, he left Italy just two days after Meredith's murder. Police get one of his closest friends, Giacomo Benedetti, to Skype with him. And what Rudy had to say was interesting. 
During their first Skype chat where they instant messaged, Rudy didn't open up much, but he did say, I was in the bathroom when it happened. I tried to stop it, but I couldn't do anything. Amanda had nothing to do with it. She wasn't there. They end the chat with Giacomo offering to send Rudy money and make arrangements to talk again. Later, police have Giacomo call Rudy on Skype from the police station in Prusia. That's where Rudy went into more detail. He told his friend that he had first met Meredith at a pub called the Shamrock while watching a rugby match. He said they teased each other over the game. The evening before Meredith was killed, they had ran into each other again at a Halloween party and made plans to get together the next day. So, the following evening around 8.30, he went to Meredith's. He said he made a pass at her, but ultimately nothing happened between them because neither of them had a condom. Later, he said Meredith had discovered that she was missing money that she had hidden in her underwear drawer and was upset about it. She told Rudy that she was going to talk to Amanda about it. He tells his friend that he was using the bathroom when he heard the doorbell ring. He thought it must have been one of the girls that lived there. About five minutes later, he hears a loud scream. It was enough to make him come running out of the bathroom to see what was going on. He said he saw a guy but couldn't see his face because it was dark. That's when he spots Meredith. Her throat had been cut. Rudy said the man tried to stab him too, but he grabbed the man's hand. And while Rudy did end up receiving minor cuts on his hand, they weren't enough to draw blood. During the scuffle, Rudy said his unbuttoned pants fell down, causing him to trip. That's when the man bolted for the front door. After that, Rudy said he got a towel from the bathroom and tried to stop the blood flow on Meredith's wounds. He said Meredith was clinging to him, but there was so much blood he got scared. He thought the police would blame him. Rudy told his friend that the assailant was Italian. He knew this for sure because they had briefly insulted one another, and Rudy said the man didn't have a foreign accent. During the phone call, he does mention Amanda and Raffaele. At one point in the conversation, he's reading from a newspaper about how Meredith's clothes were put in the washing machine. He said when he left, Meredith was still dressed, and if what the newspaper says is true, it was Amanda or Raffaele who washed them. An international arrest warrant is issued for Rudy, and he's extradited back to Italy. And get this, he had wounds on his right hand that were consistent with the slipping of a sharp weapon. If he still had wounds that were healing weeks after he received them, they would have had to have been more than minor lesions. Now, Rudy Gaudet was a person that Amanda was somewhat familiar with, but she said she didn't know his name. She had seen him around the neighborhood and had spoken to him a time or two. He played basketball with the four guys that live below Amanda's unit. Rudy has always maintained his innocence. In his prison diary, he wrote about his evening with Meredith. We talked, and at this point, I told her that I needed to go to the bathroom. The kebab was bothering my stomach. She said I could go to the bathroom near the fridge, and I went. While I was in the bathroom, I heard the sound of the doorbell. I am sure because it rang more than once. Then I put my headphones on and listened to my iPod. During the time I was in the bathroom, I listened to my favorite three songs. While I was listening to the last one, I heard screaming, even though the volume was loud, very loud screams. I wasn't even finished yet. I tried to go and see what had happened as soon as I could. I opened the bathroom door. I went toward Meredith's room. There was the back of this person inside the room, and I said, hey, what's happening? Then, I immediately saw Meredith's body on the floor, and I also saw blood. The person turned around. He was a male. He was Italian because he insulted me and had no foreign accent. He had the knife in his hand, and he tried to get me. I hadn't zipped up my pants, and while backing off, I fell. He tried to attack me, but I took a chair to protect myself. He exited through the front door, telling me, Black man found, guilty man found. Police have the knife they found at Raffaele's apartment, but they need more evidence, so they return to the crime scene. 46 days after Meredith's murder, they find her bra clasp under a rug. For the first time, investigators also use luminol to look for invisible blood stains. Three clear footprints appear, plus numerous small blood stains. 
Amanda's DNA has been found mixed together with Meredith's in five different bloodstains throughout their apartment. And tests show the footprints left behind match the size and shape of Amanda and Raffaele's feet. Nearly a year after Meredith's murder, in September of 2008, Amanda, Raffaele, and Rudy appear before a judge in Perugia. With all the publicity surrounding Amanda, Rudy pleads not guilty and opts for a fast-track trial where he will be tried separately. During the trial, his story slightly changes. He now claims that when he was in the bathroom, he heard Amanda enter the house. He recognized her voice, but his new story didn't do much to sway the jury of his innocence. Is he going to go back to the truth and say Amanda was not there, which is what he originally said, or is he going to go to one of the stories that he said later on, and maybe she was, maybe, who knows? On October 28, 2008, Rudy is found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison for his part in the murder. That same day, a judge determines that there's enough evidence for Amanda and Raffaele to stay in trial. Rudy would later appeal in November and get his sentence reduced to 16 years. The media simply wasn't interested in covering Rudy. At the end of the day, they wanted Foxy Noxy. Soon, it's Amanda and Raffaele's turn to stand trial. On January 16, 2009, their trial begins. The judge determines that the media can be present, but there will be no live TV coverage allowed. As with Rudy's trial, the prosecution insists that Meredith's death was the result of a sex game gone wrong. Amanda and Raffaele claim they weren't at Amanda's that night. The prosecution outlines the evidence they believe places the couple at the scene of the murder. Amanda and Meredith's mixed DNA are found in the house. To them, it was a sign that both Amanda and Meredith were bleeding at the same time, an indication that there had been a fight. Then, they reference the knife found in Raffaele's apartment that they believe is the murder weapon since Meredith's DNA is on it. They also cite DNA evidence on Meredith's bra clasp. Police say Raffaele's DNA is on one of the hooks. The luminal footprints are also brought up as belonging to Amanda. The prosecution argues that this is proof Raffaele and Amanda returned later to clean up and stage the break-in. The footprints are proof Amanda was walking around barefoot with her feet covered in blood. The defense argues that the luminal results might not have revealed blood. You see, chlorine bleach can produce false positives on luminol tests. The prosecution also points to Raffaele's cell phone as another indication that the couple had come back to clean up. Raffaele's cell phone was turned on at 6.02 a.m., despite their claims they had slept until 10 a.m. The lead prosecutor, Giuliano, really felt like it was going to be an open and shut case. He points out there was direct evidence and calls into question Amanda's promiscuous behavior, pointing out she brought different men home. Here's the picture he paints. Meredith comes home. She sees Amanda, Raffaele, and Rudy. Meredith becomes uncomfortable and scolds Amanda for her lack of morals. Amanda, who is now embarrassed and humiliated, begins fighting with Meredith, attacking her with a knife, all while being fueled on by Raffaele and Rudy. He called it pleasure at any cost. Newspaper headlines ran, Lucifer-like, Satanic, Demonic, Diabolical, A Witch of Deception, Luciferina with an Angel's Face. Kind of sounds like a modern-day witch hunt, doesn't it? On June 12, 2009, five months after the trial first begins, Amanda takes the stand to tell her side of the story. An interpreter is next to her. They told me that I was trying to protect someone. And mi è stato detto che stavo cercando di proteggere qualcuno. But I wasn't trying to protect anyone. Ma non stavo proteggendo nessuno. And they continued to put so much emphasis e continuavano a mettere così tanta enfasi on this message that I had received from Patrick. Sul messaggio che avevo ricevuto da Patrick. And so e quindi I almost was convinced that I had ero met convinta him. che l'avevo incontrato. On November 18, 2009, as Amanda and Raffaele's trial is coming to an end, 
Rudy makes headlines after the judge reads a summary of the case, and Rudy asks to make an impromptu statement during his appeal. Rudy said that after Meredith noticed she was missing money from her drawer, she told him that Amanda brought boys back to the house and that she couldn't stand her anymore. Later, while he was in the bathroom, he heard the doorbell ring, followed by an argument between Amanda and Meredith. Meredith said to Amanda, we have to talk. That's when Rudy turned up his iPod. Shortly after, he heard a loud scream. When he came out of the bathroom, he saw a man in Meredith's room. He put his hand on the man's shoulder and asked, what's happening? Rudy and the man scuffled back down the hallway. Then the man said, let's go. There's a black man in the house. Rudy said he could hear the footsteps of more than one person on the gravel outside. When he went to the window in one of the rooms, he saw, quote unquote, the silhouette of Amanda Knox leaving. Yeah, he dropped a bombshell. And here's the kicker. Because he made a spontaneous statement, no one could question him about it. On December 4th, 2009, more than two years after Meredith's murder, the verdict is in. Sono calma. Um, in questi giorni io ho scritto su un foglio davanti a me che avevo paura di perdere me stessa. E cioè ho paura, ho paura di avere una maschera di assassina forzata sulla mia pelle. The courtroom is so quiet. You can hear a pin drop. Chiara Nox Amanda Marie sollecito Raffaele, colpevoli dei reati loro ascritti. Amanda is found guilty of murder and sentenced to 26 years in prison. Raffaele is also found guilty and sentenced to 25 years. Amanda receives an extra year for slandering Patrick. After the verdict was read, things move quickly. Amanda is put into a black van and driven away from the courthouse within minutes. The Knox family is in pure shock. How could people who didn't know Amanda attack her character so viciously? But for Meredith's family, it brought them a tiny bit of justice. And while they were pleased with the decision, they were adamant. They didn't want Meredith being remembered for what had happened to her. Following the sentencing, Raffaele spent six months in solitary confinement. Just imagine Raffaele's situation. Somebody he had known for less than a week would change the course of his life forever. Amanda's family returns to Seattle, Washington and files an appeal as soon as they possibly can. On November 24th, 2010, three years after Meredith's murder, Amanda and Raffaele's appeal trial begins. The two have been in prison for three years. During this trial, there's a new judge and a new prosecutor. The defense focuses on Rudy. They call in other inmates who testify that Rudy confessed to them while in prison that he killed Meredith. On June 27, 2011, Rudy takes the stand and denies any jailhouse confessions. Remember, at this point, his sentence has already been reduced to 16 years. The key focus of the appeal is on DNA, specifically around the issues of contamination. Amanda's team requests to have the DNA evidence independently reviewed, including the knife and bra clasp. Contamination can make or break any case. That's why it's vital crime scenes be kept sterile. Independent forensic expert Dr. Stefano Conti said that in Amanda's case, that didn't happen. He references a video taken by the forensic police in which it shows people coming and going without any type of protective equipment or gear on. And one of those people is prosecutor Giuliano. Awkward. For those who did wear protective gear, it wasn't changed according to protocol pointing out how crime scene techs failed to change their protective shoe coverings and their gloves. There was even video evidence of police causing what looked like unnecessary damage to the crime scene with one officer kicking out a window. And Meredith's bra clasp that was said to have Raffaele's DNA on it, it wasn't found until 46 days after Meredith's murder. 
Dr. Conti argued that after 46 days, it's possible that anyone coming in and out of the house could have tracked other people's DNA on it from the kitchen, bathroom, hallway, and any other areas into Meredith's room. The clasp is seen in several different locations on the floor and even ends up in a pile of garbage. How they miss collecting it the first time around is unbelievable because it's photographed on the floor in Meredith's room on November 2nd. This is critical information because besides Raffaele's fingerprints on the door, which were most likely from him attempting to break it open, no other evidence links Raffaele to the room. Now, Raffaele's DNA was found on one of the class hooks, but listen to this. There were at least two other unknown male DNA profiles found on the clasp too. But here's the thing, police never noted them as evidence. The collection of the bra clasp and procedure used also raises issues. Not only was it touched several times in succession by various people, you can even see dirt on one of the investigator's gloves and they even dropped the bra clasp on the floor. Not only were there issues of contamination at the crime scene, but there were also issues with contamination in the laboratory. Meredith's DNA found on the knife in Raffaele's apartment was in such a small amount that it was believed it could really only mean one thing, contamination. The forensic experts completing the independent review had questions. When the knife was being tested for DNA, was it analyzed alone or was it processed with other evidence? It turns out the original forensic team had tested it along with 50 other samples of Meredith's DNA at the same time. This was huge, but the prosecutor and law enforcement stuck by their findings and doubled down. In Giuliano's eyes, there was no doubt. Amanda was guilty and her irrational behavior said it all. But here are the facts. There are no traces of Amanda's DNA anywhere in Meredith's room. And the DNA evidence from Raffaele is unreliable at best. What we do have is multiple sources with Rudy's DNA on it. We know he was at Meredith's, in her room, his DNA is inside her, it's on her purse, he flees the country two days after her murder, he had cuts on his hand that were still visible two weeks later, and he has a history of breaking and entering. Amanda addresses the court. None of my hospitality trovar me qui. Una condonata per un crimine che non ho commesso. Alla famiglia e ai cari di Meredith, voglio dire che mi dispiace molto che Meredith non c'è più. Non posso sapere come vi sentite. Ma anch'io ho delle sorelle piccole. E l'idea della loro sofferenza è infinita mancanza mi terrorista. On October 3rd, 2011, nearly four years after Meredith's murder, Amanda and Raffaele await their fate for the second time. In nome del popolo italiano, la Corte di Assise di Appello di Perugia assolve entrambi gli imputati dai reati loro scritti ai capi A, B, C e D per non aver commesso il fatto. The Court of Appeals absolves them of their crime and orders their immediate release. The public is outraged. Amanda arrives home to Seattle on the evening of October 4th, 2011. I'm, I'm really overwhelmed right now. Um, I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. Um, what's important for me to say is just thank you to everyone who's believed in me, who's defended me, who's supported my family. If you think this is the part where I tell you about what Amanda and Raffaele go on to do with their lives, you'd be wrong. The two get just a small taste of freedom. Amanda returns to the University of Washington to study creative writing. But the Italian justice system isn't done with them. It's the prosecution's turn to appeal. On March 26, 2013, two years after their acquittal, six years after Meredith's murder, Italy's highest court overturns the Court of Appeals decision and finds the pair guilty once again. 
they order a new trial, stating that the first appeal didn't touch on many of the things outlined in the 10,000 pages from the first trial and focused too much on the DNA evidence. On September 30th, 2013, the second appeal begins. This time, the trial takes place in Florence. Amanda is not present because she refuses to travel. Can't say I blame her. But Raffaele attends and makes a plea to the judge and jury to look at the reality of the whole situation. The judge orders a forensic lab in Rome to test the DNA found on the knife in Raffaele's apartment. The DNA on the handle matches Amanda, but again, that makes sense. She spent time at Raffaele's apartment where the two cooked meals together. On January 30th, 2014, after deliberating for more than 12 hours, shortly after 9.30 p.m., the judge reads the verdict. Nome del popolo italiano, la Corte d'Assise d'Appello di Firenze, nel procedimento penale contro Nox Amanda Marie, sollecito Raffaele, ridetermina la pena inflitta a Nox Amanda Marie complessivamente in anni 28 e mesi 6 di reclusione. Guilty. And this time, he adds two and a half years to the former sentence. Amanda is sentenced to 28 years and six months in prison. Raffaele is sentenced to 25 years and ordered to surrender his passport. Amanda won't have to worry about extradition unless the ruling is upheld. Patrick is also awarded 40,000 euros in compensation. On March 25, 2015, the final appeal begins, and Italy's Supreme Court will need to decide whether or not to uphold the guilty verdict. After a day and a half of hearing final arguments, a panel of five judges must consider everything they've heard. After 10 hours of deliberation, shortly before 11 p.m. on March 27, 2015, the final verdict is announced. The court annuls Amanda and Raphael's prior convictions and declines to order another retrial. I'm incredibly grateful for what has happened, for the justice I've received. The only thing Amanda is not cleared of is her charge of slander on Patrick Lumumba. Nearly eight years after Meredith's murder, Amanda and Raffaele are exonerated, with the court stating there were stunning flaws in the investigation and that the increased media attention created a frantic search for guilty parties. They went on to say that there was a complete lack of biological traces connecting Amanda and Raffaele to the crime, and that the evidence still points to Rudy Gaudet. Meredith's family is stunned and heartbroken. They've been left with so many questions that will never be answered. Les has been almost forgotten in all of it. The media photo can't really of her. Um, there's not a lot about what actually happened in the beginning. Um, so it's very difficult to kind of keep her memory alive in all of this. After their acquittal, Raffaele and Amanda had to rebuild their lives again. Amanda returned to Seattle, but life wouldn't be the same. She was labeled a sexual deviant, and the whole world knew private, intimate details of her life. Amanda graduated college in 2014 with her bachelor's degree in creative writing. She works with the Innocence Project to advocate for the wrongly convicted, runs a podcast with her husband, and is a freelance journalist. In January of 2019, she was awarded roughly $16,000 after winning a European human rights case against the Italian government. Raffaele still lives in Italy and works as a software engineer. He also serves as a true crime expert for Italian television and has written a book about his experience going through all of this. He's been very vocal about the difficult financial implications of clearing his name. In 2017, Rudy was given partial release, which allowed him to leave prison during the day and work. And in November of 2021, he was released from prison after completing 13 of his 16-year sentence. I feel like the justice system has failed in nearly every way here. The person who the evidence most strongly points to only served 13 years for murder. And Meredith, the biggest victim in all of this, was forgotten about. My heart hurts for her family. They've dealt with this entire situation with such dignity and grace. At the end of the day, all they wanted was to see justice served and Meredith being remembered for who she was, not for what happened to her. Everyone that met Meredith loved her. She was a sweet, kind, and caring person. Even the people she had just met in Italy were completely devastated and broken. She deserved more than what happened to her. 
Patrick Lumumba would go on to lose everything, including the bar that he worked so hard for. He now lives in Poland with his wife. I know I've given you a lot to unpack today, but I cannot wait to hear from you. Do you think this is a classic case of trial by media, or do you believe that Amanda and Raffaele are guilty? Let me know what you're thinking. If you enjoyed today's episode, give it a thumbs up, and hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation.